The Practical Animal Channel is dedicated to the public understanding of the animal industry, the opportunities it provides, and the skills needed to succeed in it beyond being a volunteer or apprentice. Today we look at the pet shop industry. The county of North Yorkshire in Great Britain is home to several areas of outstanding natural beauty. The county town is North Allerton, which surely has to be one of the most promising towns in the country for the naturalist, being home to a well-stocked bookshop, an excellent shop that sells wildlife cameras and wild bird food, and a fantastic specialised pet shop, Aquatic Fanatic. It is fantastic because of the diversity of animals it sells, and also because it has recently bred chinchillas. I have always believed that a happy animal is one that will breed when in captivity. Every week I interview a guest who works with animals. I ask what motivates them. Today we go to Aquatic Fanatic, where I talk to a senior member of staff, Guy Dillon. He is responsible for many aspects of running the business, which sells livestock at good prices and with welfare as top priority, a goal they have clearly reached given their breeding success with chinchillas. When asked what motivates him, he replied, he loves that no two days are the same. It never gets boring. There are always new ways to develop, either personally or the business itself. I think one of the main things that confirms I am right in the job, said Guy is the amount of people who envy my job, which is a nice feeling to have. I've had 9 to 5 office jobs in the past, and it just hasn't suited me. I think my motivation comes from the fact that I love animals, and therefore having a job which is predominantly based around animal husbandry makes it feel like it isn't just a job, it's a way of life. So I never have to find motivation it's already there. I began by asking Guy what made him get involved in the pet shop business. been working in food production for quite a long time but I've got to the end of the road almost as far as I could go with within working with food I've always had the hobby of sort of like taking care of animals keeping animals you know uh, with, whether it's fish or my family have always said that uh, that anim I attract animals getting to the end of the road from one aspect but then having a, a bit of a life decision of thinking right I need to uh, need to make some changes and so I started to think along the lines of what do I like doing and obviously animals are the, the big part of my life so so I said well right I'll, I'll sort of make a big change and um, make a living from what I love doing which is what I've done and, and you know I haven't looked back since it's uh, I think it was one of the best things I've ever done. How would you describe your connection with animals, Guy? Throughout my whole life, injured animals have, <laughs> have sort of found me. So I think as far as making a living from, you know, animal husbandry, um, you know, care is the is the, the main thing. You know, making sure that you're, you're catering for all of those needs of every animal that's that's under your care. You're making a living from it, so it has to be it has to be business based at the end of the day. So keeping that into account, but keeping the care there is essential. I was really impressed by Aquatic Fanatic when I came there. It, it seemed to be to like uh, an independent pet shop business, but mm -hmm. offering uh, 
all the all the perks of a of a of a pet shop. You know, uh, the exotic animals, which is what attracted me. I believe when we talked, you mentioned a barn owl. What? What's yeah, that that's one? right. So, as you said, we're, we're sort of like more than a pet shop. With um, as with a lot of businesses, especially through COVID, um, had to diversify it where we can. Um, now, for us, um, starting out as a pet shop, um, but then looking at different routes and avenues to go down, um, we've gone. Um, down the route of doing pet therapy sessions at local residential care homes. We do um, these party animal sessions. So for any kids having a birthday party, we can sort of uh, do do birthdays and things like that. Educational sessions as well. And that's where the barn owl comes in because we, uh, we, we've, we've got ghost our barn owl who uh, will come out on, on therapy sessions and educational sessions um and so it's a chance for for um kids to be able to see uh something which we have in our our wildlife but we never see up close um you can see videos of, of them and you know and things like that and you can you can always google them which kids will do but it's nothing quite like seeing the real thing you know so as far as um like curriculum goes it's it's a real sort of hands-on approach to it which uh, which is something that we thought up and then with our you know it's, it's one of those things where you can pop together what we've got with what the uh, education sector needs um and it just seems to have gone together really well how does uh, therapy work using animals guy so as for um a lot of residential care homes there'll be perhaps elderly people who've lost their sight or, or hearing. Um, and so it's it's really sort of like a, a hands-on approach to pet, pet the animals, things like that. But also they're really sort of uh, sessions to enrich the days of, of, uh, of people who might not have seen exotic animals like this before, even, even may not have seen, you know, like say a barn owl that close before. It shows as you're doing these sessions how much of an impact they have when you have the residential care home workers that haven't seen such a, a reaction from from these people since they've been under their care taking around a, a royal python or something like that has all of a sudden triggered a memory or one of the most touching ones that I had recently was one of our therapy animals is a, a hen called janine so we got janine out and went around the, the circle and and it turned out one of there was an elderly gentleman there who used to be a chicken farmer and it obviously just sort of triggered all these memories back and he just came out of his shell. And it was extraordinary. It's, it's a really rewarding thing to do. Uh, I'm a little bit of a pet shop nerd guy. I mm -hmm. can't help driving past a pet shop without going into it. Uh, I've done it for years. I think it's a medical condition, really. <laughs> uh, We're, there's quite a few of us that have that. It's all right. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was talking to a pet shop owner years ago. Um, my goodness, before the invention of the internet, I'm that old. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, he was saying that um, animal sales seem to follow trends. Uh, what animal is the most popular at the moment in the pet shop industry, would you say? Um, I'm not sure about the about within the industry. Certainly with us, um, I mean, we are more known locally as um, aquatic, so... I think fish will always be our sort of top sellers. Um, so keeping a, a good stock of, of tropical fish and, and things like that. Uh, it depends on the audience. We, we have families that are getting guinea pigs and rabbits, teenagers that probably want uh, your, your reptiles. I think out of reptiles, bearded dragons are probably one of the most popular ones. How would you describe uh, having an independent pet shop Today, Guy, working in one, being involved with an independent pet shop, uh, what's it like? Is it is the industry buoyant? Is it doing well? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I, I was thinking about this the other day. I was thinking about the difference between working for an independent pet shop and what the differences must be like compared to working for a big industry pet shop. I feel like I'm benefiting more because I see more of the of the business, more of running the business rather than just um, serving customers all day. I see all aspects of the business and how the business can diversify and having a big input on uh, on that diversification as well. 
it's sort of like it's really interesting being able to see all of those aspects. How do you think the pet shop industry is going to change over the next ten years? I mean, for independent companies. Yeah, that's that's the that's the million dollar question, really, isn't it? I think um, one of those cases of looking at what the pet shop industry was doing uh, ten years ago and seeing how how things have evolved since then, and then try to make a prediction. Um, but again, who knows? I mean, there's there's all sorts of variables that can sort of you know change things for the better or worse it, that can come out of out of the blue. Um, but I think if it was to carry on at the, the steady rate that it's going, I think it's, uh, you know, it's it's always going to be there, put it that way. How do you prevent yourself from becoming too attached to the animals so that you'd be unable to sell them? That's a, that's a very good question, to be honest. And that's that's uh, something that's, um, that I've sort of had to have words with myself at certain times, you know. But at the same time, you, you do realise that it's you come, you come to realise that um, whilst all of these animals are under under your care, um, you have the pleasure of of sort of taking care of them for uh, on a on a momentary basis before they sort of find their forever home. So I feel like sometimes I feel like I've got you know hundreds of pets, but but uh, only on a on a temporary basis, which it's actually quite a quite a nice feeling. Otherwise, uh, I would be guilty of taking all of them home with me. You know, I think a, a lot of people would be. But uh, no, it's quite nice to to know that you're there. They're, they're sort of like foster parent for a, a temporary base, like you know, for a temporary time, and then uh, they find their forever home. Which is it's also lovely to see them finding their forever homes. You know, um, yeah. So it is, it's a, it's a nice thing. <laughs> The, the bird food and hedgehog food sector seems to have grown massively. When I was a teenager, all you could get in terms of bird food was a, a peanut bag. Uh, yeah, yeah. Now you can get considerably more products than that. Yeah, um, yeah. How is that sector going? Is that increasing, stable? That's something, yeah, it's something that we're finding that, uh, that, we're, that is doing um, doing a lot better as time goes on. It's It's one of those things where I think... In school, certainly, I think that's down to education because a lot of that is driven by kids that want to see wildlife in their gardens. Um, so, you know, I don't remember being a kid and having the, you know, the option of having window bird feeders, things like that, which are just like little inventions that uh, that are now really popular. And with all the different feeds, which obviously are going to attract different birds because birds have their their um particular foods that they like um we, we yeah we find that we sell um lots and lots of wild bird food but again it's it's one of those things i think that stems from education i think that uh that schools are probably um pushing wildlife as a as a big sort of topic you know which it's great that's that needs to happen i think it needs to happen more when uh, i first started the channel one of the um, target audiences I wanted to reach was further and higher education students of animal management. Is it the sort of business where you get people asking if you have any voluntary work they can do to get experience? Yes. So we we currently have um, two volunteers. We don't like to take too many on because at the same time they, they need to be enriched by their um, their experience here. So it needs to work both ways that kind of thing where you know we we um we have work to do but they have um they have things to learn so so that that works really well um but also the um going further down that educational line we like i was saying before we do these educational sessions where we'll go into schools with animals and do um do as much include as much of of wildlife into that as well what skills would you say people need to be involved in a, an independent exotic pet shop like the one that you work at, Guy? Um, do, do you see the students already having those skills or is it something that perhaps could be done better by volunteers? I think it's a, uh, it's, it's, it's a bit of a tricky question, that one, because everyone is different and everyone has uh, different reasons as to why they decided to go down that educational route. Um, but this, I mean, there's certain skills that if you don't already have, you'll end up acquiring them. 
um, whether it's just being physically fit, because it is quite a physically demanding job, down to just sort of, I mean, every animal has their quirks and you can sort of, you, you end up building this second sense of um, being able to see what an animal needs just from sort of being able to look at it and and realize that it's you know you can you can soon spot whether whether there's any needs that that animal has and it's it's yeah it's it's like a i think it's a, a sense that you grow it's not something that can necessarily be taught unless you're hands-on yeah it's a, it's a difficult one to describe i don't quite know how to how to word that one without it sort of being a um like a sixth sense you know it's uh yeah uh, what's your opinion on on care sheets? Do you find them consistent? Do you find them? Do you use them in your business? Do you find them next? We to we do like to use them because I mean, there's certain times where um, if you're sending somebody away with an animal, firstly, we need to make sure that that uh, animal is is suitable for its potential new owner and vice versa. Um, but we we always like to go through all of the the sort of care factors, the, the you know, the requirements of that animal before um, before we let the animal go. And I think the care sheet we use is really just a, um, a backup reference to everything we've already gone through with the animal's new owner so that, um, so that nothing is sort of, um, nothing's forgotten. Um, but no, I, th I think that they, I think they're essential. I think that, you know, at the end of the day, if you can give some literature to take home with them, just to make sure that everything is clear, um, then nothing, like I say, nothing's forgotten about. Just one of the services that you offer out of the, the, the many services, the four or five different services, uh, mm -hmm. one of them is, uh, uh, an animal hotel. Uh, does that always go according to plan, Guy, or does the unexpected happen? The owner doesn't come back and collect the pet. Uh, how does that work? <laughs> I think, uh, I think in general, uh, ninety-nine point nine percent of the time, touch wood, it always sort of seems to go to plan. You know, um, we we do get good feedback from that. And again, we're always looking at ways to sort of um, to to diversify in smaller aspects of the business like that. By, you know, I mean, we were, we were having a talk the other day of whether we start sending out photos of the animals whilst the, the, the owners are perhaps on holiday or something like that, you know, just as little, little um, you know, updates on how, how their, uh, their bunny rabbits are doing and things like that. Um, in general, yeah, it, it does go to, it always seems to go to plan, um, you know, and that, I think the, the key there is just keeping, finding a, a system that works and then sticking to that. At the end of the day, we, it's just a case of making sure that we, we never overbook um, so that we can always give the care uh, that's needed to, to, to each of the animals and that we're not sort of overrun. But yeah, I mean, uh, there's only been one or two cases where they've, uh, you know, the owners have perhaps been quite late in, in picking them up and things like that, you know, but uh, there's, there's normally a, a good reason. <laughs> <laughs> When you get volunteer, prospective volunteers coming for an interview, do you look for specific uh, answers that you would like to hear from them regarding why they want voluntary work in an independent exotic pet shop? So I think um, our way of, of interviewing is very informal. Um, in fact, there's, there's not really... Um, an interview process as such it's really just a, an informal chat and I think that's a better way of finding out about a person we really just go on gut feel it works both ways so as long as you know they they work hard for us and they're learning at the same time um, and the communication's kept up so that you know if there's um, there's something new happening um, in any sort of aspect of you know then it's explained so that there's the learning continues, you know, so that, you know, it doesn't just turn into the same job every day, that every day is different. And, you know, it ca continues to be an educational experience. Um, then that sort of uh, that two way uh, agreement really works, you know. So really, you, you like somebody who would aspire to work being a hard worker, but also yeah. uh, a keen learner. 
keen learner is is uh, yeah is is key yeah because I mean I think at the end of the day around that sort of time you you're really a magnet for knowledge you know you you become sort of you know it, it, as with anyone if it's something that they're really interested in then it's easier to learn what can be a bit of a sickener is and I've found it in in uh, other industries before where you've got people who are keen to learn but are just sort of dealt the same sort of remedial jobs every day. Uh, it turns into a bit more exploitation than than actually um, a two way agreement where you're learning whilst working. Uh, so we're very conscious over making sure it's educational at the same time. Is interview technique something that you talk about a lot in the business, or has the business got quite firm ideas on what works in terms of interview and what doesn't? Again, like I say, it's very for us. It's very informal. It's really just uh, an informal chat. Yeah. The reason I ask is because um, I've had scores of interviews in my time for for jobs. Yeah, it, it used to take up uh, a great deal of my time because I was very ambitious and I always wanted to work with animals. And I applied for every animal job that was going. Yeah, interview technique at that time in my life was was a major thing. So. Um, it, it certainly seems to have gone towards uh, the more informal approach. Why do you think that the informal interview approach works so much? Is it because the person's relaxed? I think that's it. I think that's exactly what it is. I think you you will gauge a, um, a more sort of honest opinion on someone if they are relaxed. Um, you can read someone a lot better. You know, if, if it's just sort of a general conversation like me and you are having now, rather than a, a very sort of prepped and polished um, interview, then you, you sort of, that's that's almost acted, you know. Um, so you, you might go away from an interview like that thinking, well, yeah, it's quite impressive, but it's, it was basically a reading from their CV rather than actually finding out about that person, you know. So I think that's why a lot of people are going for that informal approach on, on interviewing these days. I, had, I remember one of my first interviews where uh, I was go going to do uh, two weeks school work experience uh, aged 15 and uh, it was at one of Britain's premier zoos and my goodness it was like a it was like a, a court case it was a panel interview very <laughs> stiff and extremely formal and I was only going to be a volunteer for 10 days yeah uh, and that was uh, that was possibly the worst interview I've ever had and then mm. the best interview I've ever had for the best job I'd ever had was a 20-minute video call. And yeah. uh, they just wanted to tell me what the work conditions were going to be like and if I accepted it. And I got yeah. it. Yeah. That's it. I mean, at the end of the day, it's, uh, it's, it's meant to be an interview, not an interrogation. And I think uh, that's, uh, you know, if you if you interrogate someone, you're never going to find out the real them, are they? <laughs> no, absolutely true. Um, Guy, what sort of skills does a person need to be successful in this industry of having an independent exotic pet shop? Uh, without sort of sounding too broad, I think all of them. <laughs> <laughs> all the skills. <laughs> no, it's, it's one of those sorts of... Uh, sorts of places to work or you know those industries to work in where you can't you need to have a, a, a practical knowledge you know you need to be able to um for example one day you'll be putting hutches together next day you you might be sort of uh, you know diagnosing um poorly fish you know it, it's it's so diverse it's you know so um i think again going back to um that sort of being a, a magnet for knowledge and if it's something that interests you then you'll pick it up as long as you can sort of keep all of those skills then you know any skills that you don't have yet you will soon have working in in this industry you know what's uh, what's the best sort of tarantula you could recommend guy for a beginner that would be uh, that would be a case of me asking us <laughs> asking our specialist i can do if you'd like i've got to ask guy i've just come across the the cutest animal on earth visited my recent uh, my local pet shop recently sugar gliders what's the story with them do you sell them when did they become popular how do you keep them sugar gliders yeah again I'd, i'll have to i'll have to ask okay. here's lynn i can uh, i can ask you both of those questions yeah now. grand the first uh, tarantula what would you recommend as a first well, chili roses were very good so chili rose would be very or good Mexican redney or a Mexican redney 
<laughs> Which one's the most voracious? Which one's the most voracious? Similar. I like a good voracious tarantula. It's the closest I get to blood sports nowadays. <laughs> <laughs> uh, finally, Guy, um, somebody wanting to work in an independent exotic pet shop, what advice do you have to give them? Give it your all. Don't sort of uh, turn your nose up at any jobs. If it's a, if it's a mucking out day, it's a mucking out day. Yeah, I, I think it's it's what. And again, I know I've said it a lot, but uh, try and approach it as being a magnet. Try and pick up all of all of what you're seeing. Uh, make notes. If you find something that you you love doing, then you'll never work a day in your life. Uh, and I think that uh, that really speaks for itself once you once you're working in in an industry like this. And finally, Guy, is there anything that you'd like to add? Uh, no, no. Other than it's been a, a really pleasurable experience. It's uh, you know, it's a really sort of uh, enjoyable. Sort of, it's it's brought things back from from when I first started here. That uh, yeah, just sort of leading up to to to, to having our chat. Um, yeah, it's it's really sort of uh, brought back a lot of memories of what I was going through when I uh, when I first joined the team. So yeah, thank you. We've got mud skippers in at the moment. Have you? Um, yeah, yeah, and they're really fun to watch. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, that sounds yeah. Tell me about those. Where? Uh, how do you keep those? So they they only want a, a sort of shallow area of water with a bit of uh, bit of land space as well. Um, and from from a sort of like you know step back, they, you'd think that they'd be um, amphibious because they they look like they've got legs, but they've actually just got sort of developed pectoral fins that they use to sort of like flip their way across dry land um but no they're they're, they're a lot of fun to watch they're uh yeah they're, they're they're classed as a fish they they will sort of jump from one sort of water course to the other you know and uh yeah they're very lively <laughs> <laughs> guy dylan of aquatic fanatic in north yorkshire Thank you very much for being on the Practical Animal Channel. Thank you very much.